Any of y'all understand God? <laughs> you can't figure him out, can you? He works in unusual ways and strange ways. Tonight, I would like to uh, share with you something. As I look back through my life, I see how much God loved me because I can see the places that he has taken me that I have needed to be. I can see the people that he has had me around that I needed to be around. I've seen that he has taken me through things that I needed to go through because sometimes there are things within us that are just born there, the nature. There's things that uh, uh, we have learned from our, our peers, those that were around, from our, even our family. Or we've learned certain things, and they've been embedded in our heart. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I think God put a fear in my heart when I was a young boy, uh, I, I never wanted to to just love God part way. And I, when I, I remember as a young boy, and I've shared with you different times, I would, uh, I felt like God was, I just wish I almost, I, in my heart, I wish I could be back then, what I, back then, the way, I, I wish I could be in that way now. I wish I could have that pure heart. I wish I could have that sensitivity. I wish I could have that work at zero in. But what has happened through the years and what I'm trying to say is this, and, and through life and, and just living, is sometimes we let mediocrity just sort of slip in on us. And she was singing the song, you know, something to the effect, let your word speak, let your word show me if there's anything within me, you know, that I can see. Your I want your light to shine on me. You know, I pray tonight that as we uh, listen to God's voice, as he speaks to you, not necessarily what I even have to say, but maybe what God is saying to you tonight. One thing I, I, I want to say to you, uh, you know, God's got to help us live above mediocrity. Mediocrity. And, and that's a word that do, I'm not sure that we really know what that is in our hearts. In our mind, maybe we do, but I encourage you in days ahead to, to search out mediocrity and, and look at your own life and, and, and let God help you to see maybe where you're living in mediocrity. What is mediocrity? What is it? It's a state or quality of being mediocre. Mediocre. Mediocre ability, mediocre achievement, mediocre performance. You know, the world is full of mediocre. One that displays mediocre qualities. You know, there, I, I feel like maybe in certain ways I've heard, had people in the ministry that I've been involved in through the years in ministry that by their actions and some even by their words, maybe not the exact words, that they would say, Pastor Doyce, I'm happy being mediocre. I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy being mediocre. And uh, I've thought about that. And I think there's a lot of reasons that we're that way. But I believe one of the main re reasons is if, if you're a person that you're just content to be mediocre and your walk with God, and you're content with that, the reason might be that it's just that you're just plain old lazy. That's why a lot of people are just mediocre in our world today is because they're just lazy. Just lazy. Our world, why, why do we not have more people excel in things? Why do we not? I believe one of the reasons spiritually that we don't see people excel more is because they're content with where they are. That middle of the road. It's a place where usually we are content. We have contentedness on us. The mediocre place. It's in the middle of the road. It's a place where it's lukewarm. Lukewarm. Me, 
I like a hot shower. I don't like lukewarm. Now, I don't like a cold shower, but I don't like a lukewarm either. I like a hot. I like it as hot as, as a matter of fact, my wife gets on me. She says, don't run all the water out, the hot water out. And uh, I understand that because she likes to take a hot shower too. But, but you know, I don't, like, I don't like a lukewarmness in myself, in my spirit. I've got to a place in my walk with God that, that it bothers me when I feel myself getting lukewarm, when I feel myself fading over in that mediocrity. Uh, it bothers me. Francis Chan in, in uh, his book, Lukewarm and Loving It, he says, mediocrity is a place we find ourselves comfortable, content, and loving it. Comfortable, content, and loving it. We love comfortable. What does comfortable mean? It means settled in, free from all discomfort or trouble. Anybody like to live on that street? Would you like to live on that street? Sure, all of us would. Content, satisfied. We like to be just satisfied. Exodus 2.21, it says, And Moses was content to dwell with a man. And he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. Moses was content. This is after Moses had left Egypt. After he had left and after he had, he had murdered uh, this uh, Egyptian and he was on the run, he was on the backside of the desert, so to say. And he, he, he met these, he saw these girls that were out watering their animals and uh, gathering water and ran off uh, some men that were there and stuff and met them. But what happened was... Uh, he fell in love with one, and, and the father gave that daughter to, to be the husband. And he said he sort of settled in, and he was content to live with these surroundings. He was content to live in the condition that he was in because there were no pressures, no, no battles, so to say, and it just, just happy. He was satisfied and content. But like Moses... I found out there are places in my life where I like to be comfortable and safe. I, I, I like what's comfortable. I like what is safe. And, and, and when I say safe, I talk about, I'm talking about no discomfort or, 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 or no reprimands or just, you know, no, nothing, just, just peace, you know. I, I like that zone. I like that safe zone in my spirit. I, I like the predictable place. Anybody like the unpredictable? Probably very few here. If you walk with God, you better get used to that one, though, because God is unpredictable. But, you know, I, as I was jotting this down, you know, I, I know a lot of churches, that's exactly where they are right there. That's a reason there's no growth. That's a reason that, that, that things are the way they've been for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, the lifetime of the church, it, 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 is they want to be comfortable. They, they want to be safe. And, and they, want, they want what's going on to be predictable. They, want, they, they like what's been done last year this time to be done right now. They don't like change. They like to know what to expect. You know, and I'm finding out as I get older, I'm, I'm, I fight that myself. I, I, I like to, I, I feel like, you know, it sort of makes you feel like you're in control, so to say. That's a bad spot to be. God needs to be in control. In Exodus, the third chapter, verse 11, it says, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Here, what's happening here? He said, God has called him beyond his mediocrity. He's calling him all beyond his contentedness. He's calling him all beyond his uh, safe place, his predictable place, into a place that uh, might be a little tough. Yes, it will be. It says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, 
And they shall say unto me, what is, your, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? See, Moses was content with where he was. He didn't like the idea of being interrupted. He didn't like the idea of being uncomfortable. Uh, but see, God wants us to live out of that mediocrity. I'm not saying that God doesn't give us a space of grace. God doesn't give us those places where we are comfor comfortable. But it's so, sort of like ice cream. Anybody here really like ice cream? Could you eat it for breakfast too? Could you eat it for lunch? Could you eat it for supper? Could you eat it before you go to bed at night? That's sort of the way this mediocrity is. It, it's, it's so good, and it, it satisfies the flesh so much that, that you could just do it all the time. But let me ask you something. What would you look like? What do you think as we consume uh, this mediocrity? How, how, how do we look? How, do we, how does it affect us in our spirituality? Paul in Philippians, he says, not as though I had already attained. And that's where mediocrity is sometimes. We're at a place where we're, we feel like we're okay, and we feel like we have, uh, have already obtained it, we've already got, have a hold of it, and don't need any more. I'm just happy with what I have. You see, I think some of us, we used to set a, something this morning, we said settle, about settling for less than the best. Most of us have settled for less than the best of what God has for us. We have no idea. We, have no, not, we don't even think that, think that way. He says, not as though I've already attained, either we're already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before me. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Here, here Paul is giving us an answer of how we can live a life above mediocrity. He's helping us here. He's telling us uh, a, a life of growing a life of producing. Now, can you look at yourself as we're, we're using these words here? Is my life growing? Is my life producing? A life of moving forward, not stagnant. A life of defeating the old habits. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about sin, but I'm talking about things in our life that, that are maybe in the way or just sort of hinder us or things that, that slow us down, things we don't really need that other things could take the place of. Defeating the old temptations, getting off the pacifier and the bottle. That's, that's the growth. A, a, a child as it grows, you know, eventually, I was thinking about this, and if I had everybody wash your hand, I was going to have you stick your finger in your mouth. And I was going to have you suck on your thumb. And I was going to let you look at each other just to see what that looks like. Now, we laugh at that, and that's good. I, I, I wanted you to sort of get into that a little. But it is silly. It is silly. But look at it spiritually. There was a, when I was... Uh, in college, I worked in a Kroger, and in the Kroger I worked in, there was this lady that would always come in, and it just used to always get all over me when she would come in. She had these two kids. She had a kid that was like five and one like that was eight. Still on a pacifier. Can you believe that? Now, that's a little off base, I think. And I was thinking about that today, and I thought, you know, that bothered me. But, but what about the areas in our life? And that, I heard some, oh, you know. But what about the areas in our life that we're still on the pacifier? We're still on the bottle. When God has a plate of, of, 
of mashed potatoes and gravy and, and corn and steak and pork chops and salad and big glass of tea with a lemon in it. And he has all that for us. And, but we're content with sucking on a pacifier, something you don't even get anything out of. Just the pleasure of sucking on it. And that's what, there's things in our life that that's the way it is. We don't get anything out of some things in our life. We're just sucking on them, so to say. We don't get any spiritual nourishment, any nourishment in our life. We have to live above mediocrity. People who live above mediocrity, they're always, they're always, they're not satisfied with where they are. Uh, anybody ever hear of a Fallsbury flop? Some of you do. I think some of the guys, okay. There, years ago, there was a, 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 a man, and I can't, his last name was Fallsbury, flop, Fallsbury, yeah. And he was a high jumper. And everybody would jump over the high jump like this, and their leg would go over, and they would go over. But he changed everything. And he was a winner. He won. He was in the Olympics. And he used the, what they, they named this Fallsbury flop over him. And he would go over, and when he would go over, he would go over back first. You've probably seen it on TV. And then bring his legs over. Now, I don't know how, what advantage that is, but it was a great advantage. But, but he would, I, I would watch him one time when I was a young boy, and, and they would raise the mark on him, and he would raise it and raise it raise it. And what they would do when they do that, they raise it and raise it, and they keep working at getting higher. They'll even place the mark higher than they can get it to a great extent just to, in their mind, make their mind think that they've got to give it more. And as I was thinking about that today, I was thinking... Why, why do we set our marks so low? Why, why do we have such a low? Why are we not raising the mark? We, why are we not uh, trying to live above this level that we think we have to, to live? Paul says, I press for the mark. The Greek word is dioko, which means reaching for the tape. Reaching for, not like this. You see a ra or someone that runs, when they run, they don't go out and, and knock it over with their hands. That's not illegal. But they'll reach for it. They'll reach with their chest. They'll stretch their chest. They'll throw and throw their chest out as far as they can like that. A and that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about, I press toward the mark. I throw everything I have into it to get across that finish line. I throw everything. And that's what we have to do to overcome this mediocrity in our life is we have to press. I found out that Christians uh, in, in, in many churches in different places, because of their desire for contentedness and comfortableness and, and living in the place of uh, uh, comfort zones, uh, they have a tendency to not want to press. They, want, they don't want to press toward the mark. They don't want to press beyond. They don't want to raise their standard. They don't want to raise their level, their spiritual height. Paul is saying, if I'm stretching and straining to get above and stay above this mediocrity, I'm going to have to continue raising the mark. Because what will happen, you get to a place, you'll step up, and that's the way we do. We'll step up and we'll say, oh, man, Praise God, I, I'm, I'm there, I feel good. I, I mean, we're having this emotional high, so to say. And then we're content to be able to do that. And then the guy next to us, he comes and he jumps over higher than we do, and ours isn't, you know. But we're content sometimes to live there in that zone. We're to press. Paul is not content to remain where he was. He wants to go higher. We can't be, we can't be content to stay where we are. We can't be content in our personal lives to be where we should never be content. We should be thankful. We should rejoice how God's helped us. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should be negative. But we can't rest on our laurels, so to say, spiritually. We have to be reaching for a higher mark. We're climbing that ladder. Climbing that ladder. Are you content with your prayer life? Are you content? Oh, no, I'm not content. Why aren't you doing something about it? 
Why aren't we? Are, are we content uh, with the fruit that we're bearing? I don't know. I know I could bear a lot more fruit. Why aren't we? Oh, we can say, oh, I'm not content. Don't be satisfied with saying, uh, I, I'm not content. That doesn't make Jesus feel good. It sort of bothers him, I think, sometimes when we realize and we don't do it. Are you content to pass the world by that is dying and do nothing about it? These are things we need to ask ourselves individually, and I think as a body too. Are we content with where we are in carrying God's love to people, just loving people? How's your love tonight? That's something I was going to share tonight about love. But I couldn't get any clarity because I want to be able to share that a little bit. Uh, I feel like God's giving me some direction on that in a different way. But uh, are, are, your love, are, are you content with where you are there? If you're not, what are you doing about it? Mother Teresa, of course we know her. She was a winner of the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. And uh, Judy Jones gave me a book not too long ago about her and a very uh, interesting lady who, who loved God very much. And uh, she wrote in one of her journals one time, and it was toward the end of her life. Uh, I would like to read to you what she said. And it goes right along with what we're talking about, about mediocrity. It says, may I truly, she's writing this. She says, may I truly obey you talking to God. Here's a lady that dedicated to giving her life. She worked with lepers in a leper colony. Uh, not a young lady. Didn't get, make excuses for things in her life, but gave her life. May I truly obey you starting today. In other words, it's not, wow, I'm thankful. I've done, I'm, I'm, boy, I'm, I'm doing good. No, I want to do more. I want to set that higher. Starting today, I want to do more. To be a courier of your love, like we were talking about. I want my love to be of your grace to a hurting world. Because up to now, I have really done nothing, she said. Huh. Up to now, I've really done nothing. You know, I believe this is a characteristic of a person that's trying to raise the mark out of mediocrity, trying to raise that level. I believe, I believe that's a, uh, uh, an example, a characteristic of rising above the mark. You see, not contented, not comfortable with where she is, not settling in that comfort zone. You know, if you think that God's going to allow you to get to a certain place and just be contented to remain at that level, no, he's going to prod you. Sometimes we feel we don't we struggle with where we are. That's good. Sometimes people uh, tell me where they're at, and I want to say, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do you ever realize that maybe God might be in some of your struggle? Maybe some of the what you're going through is to help you rise above mediocrity. Maybe He's trying to point out some things to you. Maybe he's trying to bring you in a reality. People who are living above mediocrity, they have to forget the past. They have to forget their past failures, and they have to keep reaching for that mark. In this part of this verse, 13, Paul says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before me. He's saying he is forgetting the past and going forward. Now, he's one that has a lot to say, I'm forgetting if we hang on to a lot of things in our past, if we hang on to a lot of things that are, are just happened yesterday, we hang on to those things and allow ourselves, you know, those things could weigh us down. It's a lot of baggage. The devil tries to put baggage on us. He tries to waste us. Some things we just need to give to God, and we need to start rejoicing for what God is doing. 
what God is doing, how He is working, how He is helping, and that how, what God's going to do, I'm in this battle and I'm in this struggle instead of woe is me and how I feel and how hard it is and oh, I just don't, I'm not all that like that, but praise God. You know, God's trying to, He's taking me through this because He's wanting to show me something to help me grow. He's helping me strain myself in my spirit because he's wanting me to go. You know, God will put us in situations to pull things out of us and use spiritual muscles that we normally wouldn't use because we're contented, because we're comfortable. He will. He says, I press toward the mark. I'm sorry. Press toward the mark. Forgetting the path, those things behind uh, have you ever, have you ever visualized the example God has given us in our anatomy? Have you? I want you just to take a look at yourself in your mind. <laughs> okay, your feet. Which way do they point? Forward. Your knees. Which way do they bend? Forward. Your nose. Well, I'm trying to stay away from that one. Your nose. Which, which way does it go? Forward. Your eyes. Which way do they look? Forward. Your ears. <laughs> which way do they face? Forward. Some of us, no, all of us, but they do. They're they're put. They're they're created to hear forward. They are. Everything is going forward in the anatomy, and we'll stop right there. We, there's a lot of things we, but there's only one thing that's on the other side. Hmm, that's left behind, which proves. Which proves there's some things that need to be left behind. True? And there's things in our life that's that way. They need to be, we just need to leave them behind. There was a woman in Mark that had several failures but kept pressing toward the mark. She, she, had a, she was bleeding, and, and she went to different places and different doctors and tried different things, and she failed a lot of areas of her life, but it didn't stop her. She kept pressing, didn't she? It says that she pressed toward Jesus. She was probably, in my mind, I vision that she was almost crawling, and she was down on her knees. It says that she touched, the, she says, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. But she was pressing even then. She didn't feel like pressing. She didn't feel like going to church. Hmm. She didn't feel like praying. She didn't feel like doing this. But she pressed beyond what the flesh wanted her to do. And I'm not telling sick people to come to church, okay? But she had to press. But there's sometimes all it is is just an excuse. I'm sorry. I got to throw that one in too. It's just an excuse because you don't want to come. Laziness. It's just an excuse, that's all. God does not accept. I had a band director, I skipped school one time. He had me come in, and, and he was a man, he, me and him had a great relationship spiritually. He was a Christian, I was a Christian. We prayed together, loved each other, and he was almost like, I mean, he was just sort of my mentor. And I got caught by my mother skipping school with a friend. She took me to school. I got a whipping on my birthday. It was my birthday. That's why I skipped. I got a whipping on my birthday for skipping school with this friend. It was his idea. Skipping school. Yeah, no excuse, right? No excuse. And I went to, when I come in and I had this paper written by my mom and I handed it my, my, to my band director. I said, here, Mr. Sperlin. I says, Here's my excuse. He opened it up. He handed it back. He says, I'm sorry. He says, that won't work. I don't accept excuses. And I didn't know what to say. He says, now if you give me a reason, that's different. He says, you take that on. He says, can you give me a reason? I said, no. 
No, not one that, that's right, not one that you'll. He says, okay. He says, I appreciate your honesty. And that's why, that's, see, God is wanting us to just be honest. Sometimes we have to press beyond certain things. Press. She came in the press, it said. Verse 27, it says, she came in the press behind. This woman was determined to get out of the condition she was in. We have to be determined to get out of mediocrity. It has to be a mindset. It has to be something that we check in our mind every day. It has to be something when we pray that we consider in our mind She was in a weakened condition. I'm going to tell you something. Mediocrity will weaken you. It will make you spiritually weak. And you won't even notice. Paul says in Philippians 3, 14, he says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you pressing toward the mark? Do you have your eyes set uh, higher than, than the mediocrity? Are you pressing toward that mark? Or are you content to living in that weakness, weak condition of mediocrity. Have you settled in for less than the best? Again. People who are living above mediocrity are living their lives for a purpose greater than themselves. Okay, right there. Right there. Answers a lot of our, our questions. Why we're content to live in mediocrity. We don't want any more. We're just happy with where we are like that. But see, it's not just you. It's not just about you. This is about maybe a lot of people. Who are you called to? Hmm. Who are you called to love? Who are you called to reach out to? Who are you called to pray for? Who are you called to, to lead into the kingdom of God? Who are you called to? And you're content with mediocrity? Well, all what's helping them get into the kingdom, maybe, is your mediocrity? Is that what's helping them get into the kingdom? I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling for Christ Jesus, my Lord. Maybe the problem is we've lost our purpose. See, me mediocrity uh, causes us to lose our purpose. Saul lost his purpose, really. Saul lost his purpose. The, the, the Israelites lost their purpose. And when David came up, what did he say? He says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? We've lost our cause because mediocrity. We get tired of fighting. We get tired of being one of God's soldiers. We get tired of the battle. We get tired of the everyday doing this and doing that and the monotony that seems monotony sometimes that God's just teaching us with again. We get tired of that. Or maybe we haven't lost our purpose. We've just never seen it. We've never seen our purpose. Maybe that's where some of us are. We've got to, if, if we don't see our purpose, we'll live in mediocrity because we're not challenged. We don't see a reason. Without a vision, the people perish. We have to see that. We've been talking about that in staff meeting some. Maybe it's we have had the wrong purpose. And that's why we're living mediocrity. We're li our purpose, it's okay to live in that mediocrity because our purpose, that's where our purpose is. That's where those were around. They're living in mediocrity. And we don't, you know, so our, maybe, our, we, we've, maybe what's happening is we've had the, we have the wrong purpose. Or maybe we're living mediocrity because we've been living for ourselves. And that's been our purpose. For ourselves. We are a selfish people. That's one reason God, the, the two great commandments, the second one was to love your neighbor as yourself. 
that tells us one day that dinged on me. We are selfish people. We are. You think of it. In our life, we're selfish. Well, if we could take that selfishness and be selfish for other people that way, mm, that'd be something. That would be something. Proverbs 19, 21, and the message says, We humans keep brainstorming options and plans, but God's purpose prevails. God's purpose prevails. If we're living in mediocrity, God will interrupt. I'm going to tell you this. We're going to touch on this a little bit, but God will interrupt us to get us out of our mediocrity. He will. Many people are stuck in this mediocrity. And along this journey that God has for us, He's going to interrupt you. Maybe some of the things that you don't understand is God's interruption to help get you out of mediocrity. People, you ever see people get out of that mediocrity, mediocrity zone when the, the, they're living there, they go their whole life, and all of a sudden the doctor says, they, they, they throw out that C word to you. Or, or they throw out that, oh, you got a tumor or something like that. Well, all of a sudden that mediocrity, it changes, doesn't it? You start getting serious about things. And you're not living here. You've got to realize, boy, I've got to jump up here. Wouldn't it be great if we were already up here? We wouldn't have to rise up there. And when we're confronted by those things, we have the strength and the power to be able to follow through. Does your life seem to be just going through the motions? Hmm? Are you content to be in the comfort zone? Do you feel an overwhelming emptiness in your life? I want to read you something. I think I read this one time before. It's a little story here about Mrs. Jones. It says, She lived an old maid, Miss Jones, an elderly spinster, lived in a small Midwestern community. She had the notoriety of being the oldest resident of the town. One day she died, and the editor of the local newspaper wanted to print a little caption commemorating Miss Jones' death. However, the more he thought about it, the more he became aware that while Miss Jones had never done anything terrible or wrong, she had never spent the night in a jail or never had even been drunk, yet she had never actually done anything. While musing over this, the editor came by and sat down beside him one morning, and they drank coffee together. The editor did with the owner of the tombstone establishment in the community. He poured out his soul. He said this, the tombstone pr proprietor stated that he had been having the same problem. He wanted to put something on Miss Jones' tombstone besides Miss Jones, Miss Nancy Jones, born such and such a date and died such and such a date. But he couldn't think of anything significant, significant that she had ever done. The editor decided to go back to his office and assign uh, the first reporter he came across the task of writing a small article suitable for both the paper and the tombstone. Upon returning to the office, the only, the only fellow around was a sports editor. So he gave him the assignment. They tell me, if you pass through the little community, you'll find the following statement on the tombstone. She lies, here lies the bones of Nancy Jones, for her life held no terrors. She died an old maid, no hits, no runs, no errors. What a life. Just sort of passed through. No meaning, no purpose, didn't do anything. Wow, what would that be like to get to heaven and to stand before God and he say, no hits, no runs, maybe a few errors. Hmm. Does it seem that life is predictable and lacks substance? Does it seem that your life has no clear direction? 
Does it seem that life is maybe passing you by or almost passed you by? I want to tell you something. This year has flown by. I mean, I'm telling you, it has flown by. My mom used to tell me, he says, the older you get, the faster they go. Well, I don't know. Mine shifted gears this year for some reason. I don't know what it was. It really did. It seems like life seems to be passing by. Does it seem like your time spent doing things, you're, you're doing things you just don't want to do? You know? If this looks like you, and you're feeling like, maybe you feel like telling God, you know, God, I want to raise the mark. I don't want to live here anymore. I realize I want my life, I want, when, when I leave, I want, I want to know that there's something that could be left, I could leave behind to know that I did something for you. Raise the mark. Time to forget about the past. Time to forget about the little things that get in our way along the way and, and start doing things we need to do and think about what God has for us and wants, how he wants to use us. It's t maybe it's time for us to find a greater purpose than our own self. Maybe we, our purpose could be others. Maybe that's why we feel so lonely. Maybe that's why we feel so void is because it's always been to self and we haven't been giving to others because as you give, you receive. And maybe the reason we're not receiving is because we're not giving. Maybe what God wants to do in our life is to try to interrupt us out of me mediocrity. You know, throughout the Bible, we see that taking place. God interrupted Noah's life. Hey, Noah, I, I, I want you to build an ark. I want to tell you something, that was an interruption. That was. That was an interruption. Don was watching this deal he mentioned on Wednesday night about this guy's sort of a written, more contemporary rendition of, of Noah and the ark. But there was a lot of truth in that little movie clip there that, that stuck out. But can you imagine what he must have been up against? Can you imagine what his family thought? Can you imagine what the world around him thought? What do you think when he told them, hey, guys, there's going to be a flood? Mm-hmm. What's a flood? Had never rained. Had never rained. The moisture had come up through the ground, like a dew, I believe. Noah, I believe he was uncomfortable. Probably, and here he was, what got, what, he wasn't a spring chicken either. He wasn't. He had a few miles on him. And then, you know, so don't ever think that you can prop up your heels and sip tea with God. Don't ever think that. Sometimes the greatest things done in people's lives are at the end of their life. You do some reading. Do some reading about some of the men of God and how God used them at the end of their life. That ought to encourage us. You know, because some of us got a late start, didn't we? And we have to make up some time. What about Abraham? He was called out of his comfort zone. What about Moses? He was interrupted. Boy, he was having it pretty easy. His bubble was burst. I mean, he was, he was living prime time. What about Naaman? Dipped seven times. What, what about Joseph? The young boy with a coat of many colors and, and just had it pretty easy. Didn't even have to go work with the brothers, you know, because his dad loved him more than he did the other brothers. He was preferred above them. And God shook him up didn't he? because God had a plan for him and he interrupted his mediocrity his contentedness. What about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Wow. And Joseph, the father of Jesus. Wow. That's a hummer. Put, uh, tell you what, wear his sandals for a while, guys. Wear, wear Mary's shawl for a while. Put yourself in her place and think about all she went through. Think about the mind battles. Think about the attack of the devil. 
We can't live in mediocrity. You know, it's hard to find God's will in mediocrity. It is. If you're living in mediocrity and you're praying and asking God for God's will, you're going to have to rise above that because your radar gets off. It gets fuzzy. And it's not clear and it's hard to hear and it's hard to discern God's will when you're living in mediocrity. You know, what about the birth of Jesus? It interrupted the world. And he's trying today to interrupt the world, I believe. He's trying to shake them out of their mediocrity. I think in days ahead, you're going to be able to witness and see and know and see how God is working. You know, it's funny how you can look back in your life and you can just see so clear. Hindsight is real clear, isn't it? You can see, and you can see how God was trying to do. Let's stand. Our Heavenly Father.